Um, I know that some people have called looking for the PowerPoint presentation. Um, in case you, I have not sent it out. I actually was working on finishing it up this weekend, and therefore, um, it's just it, it was just done recently. But if you want to get a copy of it, it'll be available after the uh, the seminar. You can either email me or Jamie Breen, who also sent you an email, and uh, she'll make sure that you get um, the PowerPoint. Okay, um, and then next, um, I just want, we've got a couple announcements to uh, run through. First off, the webinar is approved for 1.5 hours of Texas CE credit. Um, and if you're, atten you're attending the webinar live and are interested in getting these credits, please send your full name and your Texas license number to uh, Jamie Breen here, and she will make sure that you get set up for the CE. Um, the next thing, um, our next webinar will be on advanced workers' compensation subrogation. Um, it'll be presented by Gary Wickert. It'll be about two hours, um, so it's a pretty comprehensive um, webinar, advanced compensation um, topics. It'll take place July 21st, beginning at 10 a.m. So uh, there'll be a, an email coming around in case you're interested in signing up for that one as well. Um, a couple a couple things to point out here. Um, if you've got questions, you can type them in, and they will show up, and I'll try to get them answered. Otherwise, I will open up questions at the end, uh, assuming we've got some, some time left. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, if you uh, again, if you've got questions, just let me know. But um, first things first. Um, again, my name is uh, Attorney Ryan Woody uh, from Matisse and Wicker and Lair. We're a national subrogation law firm. We handle uh, the most occupational accident subrogation. Um, of any law firm in the country, um, and, and we re literally, we literally wrote the books on subrogation. We've got a number of them, uh, whether it's on uh, ERISA health insurance, which also includes um, a nice section on occupational accident subrogation. We've got a book on workers' compensation. We've got a fundamentals of insurance coverage book. We've also got Gary's uh, favorite book, uh, Where's the Beef, uh, which is real popular and, and discusses. Uh, uh, collisions involving livestock around the country. Um, but today's seminar, we're just going to be specifically focusing on occupational accident subrogation, um, which I know that a lot of people um, are, are interested in because there's just not a lot of information out there, out there about this unique product. Um, but in addition to occupational, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about um, subrogation in, in general. Um, really. We first have to make the case for subrogation. A lot of people I, I talk to in the industry, whether it's um, attorneys, um, managers, claims adjusters, they really they don't understand necessarily the benefits of subrogation and, and how things work. Um, first of all, subrogation is, is really critical to reducing premiums, and I know that there's a lot of um, skepticism of, of whether this is true, but it def I, can, I can definitely assure you I've talked to underwriters and it definitely is a big factor in adjusting uh, premiums. First, since um, I, I've got this stat I, I was able to drag up, but obviously everyone knows that um, health insurance costs have, have absolutely soared. And uh, you know, just in the last um, 10 years, it's, it's up about 78%, which is a, which is a significant amount. Um, and we know that subrogation through the underwriting process goes back into the, the, the pool of money and is adjusted for the, um, the actual risk that's out there and actually ends up, you know, it, the more subrogation um, recoveries that, that the insurance company gets, the lower that, that premium that they can charge uh, going forward. 
generally between 3 and 5% of all paid claims that you are going to have has subrogation potential. Many times you'll find, I find, I think ACAC claims might even be a little bit higher. So we've, we've really got to be on our game um, when we're subrogating these ACAC claims and, and knowing that, that a lot of them have subrogation potential. And um, if we're not looking, we simply won't see it. So subrogation is certainly important, but let's talk a little bit about the ACAC uh, policy. We know it's a, it's a unique policy, it's a, a niche product, um, and there's only a handful of uh, insurance companies around the country that um, are actually writing this product. So it's not, um, it's not, it's not something that's out there for, you know, with every, every insurance company. I, I would say there's maybe five, six um, um, major insurers that write this product. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's understandable. It's not, um, it's, not a, it's not a very widespread product. Um, but very generally, what we're talking about is it, 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 it provides medical coverage. It provides disability benefits, um, accidental death benefits, dismemberment benefits um, for accidents that occur while the, while the independent contractor, while the driver is under dispatch. Um, and I say driver because most typically these are policies that are sold to the owner-operator, independent contractor drivers. So we're most, mostly dealing with the trucking industry. Um, not always. I mean, the ACAC coverage can, can, um, can be used for other self-employed individuals. It's also available to basically a, a wide array of independent contractors. However, it's mainly marketed to the trucking industry. So that's where we're going to be seeing it the most. Um, it's not subject to state workers' compensation laws. So this is not workers' compensation. The first page of, uh, of just about any OCAC policy says right on it, this is not workers' compensation. So, so forget what you know about workers' compensation. You know, workers' compensation is, 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 is unique. It's state by state. But it had, we have the benefit of, of, of looking to the state statute to find guidance from everything from how, how benefits are paid out um, to how subrogation is determined to um, how any, you know, subrogation is allocated. Um, we don't have that. Forget all that. We don't have that here. Um, so one other thing is, is a lot of people you might know about ERISA. Uh, whether these pro this product is covered by ERISA is really something um, that I've studied a lot about. Uh, and it probably would, would, would take another seriously long seminar to get everyone on the same page about um, how s some of these policies can be covered by ERISA. I don't want to go there today. I, I know it's a, kind of a controversial subject in the industry. But if you've got questions about how and when these policies can be covered by ERISA, give me a call or shoot me an email after, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, Moving on, let's, let's talk more specifics about the, uh, the insurance policy. Um, generally, these policies are, in, uh, are purchased uh, through an insurance trust um, or a motor carrier or a trucking association. And that trucking association is the actual group policyholder. Um, so the individual driver is not going to be the named policyholder. He will get an individual certificate of coverage. Um, the policyholder is the one that actually negotiates the terms of this policy. Um, now, you might see uh, an examples of, of policyholders like the National Truckers Association, Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association, the American Truckers Association, United Truckers Association. There's a lot of them out there. Um, okay, and they all um, market this product to their uh, member drivers. You're going to look uh, when you get the when you take a look at your policy, oftentimes there is a contract um, situs or um, a delivery. Uh, where it, it specifies where this policy is delivered. And that's an important detail that we'll get to later as to why it's important as to where this contract was delivered and what laws it, it is governed by. Um, but generally, the insurance covers people, drivers from 18 to 75. You've got to be in that age group to qualify. And generally speaking, you must work um, full-time or at least 30 hours a week 
um, adding up to be about $1,500 hours per year to qualify for this coverage. And more importantly, you must, uh, you know, I underlined it, you must be an independent contractor and you're not an employee. This is an important distinction that's very important to the, to the motor carriers. They, they do not want these independent contractors to ever be designated as, as actual employees. And they're not. They're independent contractors. They're generally, you know, mom and pop little businesses. Husband and wife are a trucking company. Um, and they uh, may latch on to one specific motor carrier. They may latch on to a number of, of different motor carriers over the year. But they are an independent contractor. Um, so be, now that we know a little bit about the policy, um, let's kind of go through um, an, an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. What is the purpose of this webinar? Um, well, I, I think there's three um, important areas that I want to cover today, and that's liability, law, and labor. You can call them the three L's of successful subrogation. Um, but basically what we're going to do is, is first let's get into understanding tort liability. If your um, main focus is, if you're an adjuster out there, a claims handler, uh, maybe your main focus is really just limiting the, the company's, the insurance company's liability on a claim, trying to pay um, only what is reasonable and what's necessary on a particular claim. So your focus is really adjusting the initial claim. Um, and, and, and that's fine. That's great. You know, we need you. Um, however, uh, when we turn over to the third party aspect, that's where it's a different ball game. And we've really got to understand um, tort liability, how that works in order for us to, to ever really and focus on subrogation, because that's what we're doing. We're in a different ballpark. We are, we're pursuing a third party, someone who is actually responsible for creating your member's condition. Uh, so we'll go through some of the, the, the major types of claims that you can look out for, and we'll talk about what, what you need to look for, or what you need to collect as far as um, evidence or statements go, um, and, then, and then we'll, we'll just kind of you know, take you through that. And then second, I want to move into a more, more advanced concepts here. And we're going to talk generally about once we've identified subrogation, you know, how, how, how do I go about pursuing it? What, legally, what are my rights? Do I have the right to, to, to the first reimbursement or first subrogation dollars out there? Or do I have to wait until my member has recovered or my truck driver has recovered first? Um, are my rights going to be somewhat limited? And, and how do those state laws apply to reduce my subrogation interest? What are the arguments I can make to overcome some of those obstacles? I'm going to talk about all of those major issues that you need to be looking out for. Because obviously we know uh, OCAC is unique. We don't have the benefit of, uh, of workers' compensation statutes. So we, we are almost at a disadvantage, and we really need to know how the law applies to us. Because it's really easy for those work comp claims adjusters to figure out how the subrogation is going to work. It's not as easy for, our, for us in the OCAC industry. Um, and then third, we're going to talk about what, what it takes to really develop um, and, and work on these claims so that we are recognizing and, and, and recovering the most in our subrogation dollars for, for our respective company. Um, but basically, I think every person who's working on uh, an OCAC claim uh, from the beginning, from, from day one, when you first take in that claim, you've got to be looking um, not just for at, 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 at what are the injuries, what do I have to pay, um, what is my exposure, but is there a third party? Do I have subrogation rights? And you've got to be able to answer really all of these, these six questions here on every, every claim that comes across your desk. First, you've got to know and understand what your subrogation rights are. And we'll talk about all of these throughout the presentation. You, but, but in doing that, you need to know what third parties can be sued uh, in, this, in a particular jurisdiction where the accident occurred. Um, who can I pursue? Um, can I pursue you know, um, uninsured motorist carriers? Can I, can, I, can I pursue only the third party who's actually at fault? Um, so we'll talk about those. Um, and then we're going to talk about identifying what the obstacles of subrogation are. You've got to know um, if you're operating in an anti-subrogation state, how that's going to affect you 
and how that affects your, your subrogation rights and if there are any arguments around that. Otherwise, I don't, wanna, I don't want you wasting all your time um, working up um, a case, uh, you know, a three or $4,000 case in an anti-subrogation state if we're going to be barred. Uh, fourth, in that particular jurisdiction, how is the recovery allocated? How are we going to divide up the settlement or the judgment between the driver and the OCAC carrier? How is that allocated? We've got to know that going in. Um, fifth, are attorney fees and costs going to be owed? Am I, as the insurance carrier, the OCAC carrier, going to have to actually owe um, a, a third or 40% of my lien based on what the employee or the driver, excuse me, the driver um, has contracted with his attorney at? Um, and then finally, do we get a future credit? This is such an important, um, it, it, it's really just such an important question that you've got to um, know because um, a lot of times, especially with our larger claims, there might be a settlement long before we're done paying benefits. And if that happens, um, if you don't know, if you're not entitled to a credit um, and you don't document that credit, you know, at least through a um, some type of a, a settlement agreement, um, you're going to be stuck paying benefits into the future, um, even though your, your, your driver has obtained a, a very large settlement um, that, that takes care of future medicals. So we've got to get in there and we'll talk about all these issues, but you've got to be able to answer these questions on, on every particular claim. So let's, let's get started with, with, with part one. This is just kind of the, the basic intro to, um, to subrogation, who the third parties are, how do we pursue these, these, these routine claims that we're going to get. Um, obviously, when I said recognition is important because if we don't recognize the subrogation potential from day one, and I'm talking from day one when those claims first come in, um, it really won't be acted on. Or if you recognize it a year later, it's going to be too late, and we'll talk about why. But it really requires a lot of training. And I understand that everyone um, is not maybe used to looking out for subrogation. They don't. Um, think that that is the most important um, part of their job, but it is significant, and if you don't do it from day one, um, we're going to be missing out on a lot of subrogation claims, or even the ones that we finally do locate, we're going to have limited uh, recovery potential because we've waited so long. Um, it requires you to, to, to really act in a different role than you might be used to. Um, like I said, if you're a claims handler or an adjuster and you're working up the, that side of the claim, um, your, your obligation really to the company is to try to limit the exposure. You know, We're not going to pay for things that are pre-existing or things that are unrelated to the, to the accident. And so your focus is on limiting that exposure to the company. Um, so you're probably thinking pretty conservatively. You probably come across a lot of drivers who are exaggerating their injuries, who are malingering. And that kind of puts you in a, in a state of mind to be skeptical of, of their claim. But when we're talking about subrogation, you actually have to turn yourself into the most um, um, notorious plaintiff's attorney. You know, you're going after the ambulance. You're, 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 that, you're that guy. And you've got to turn in and, and be that person and think, hey, is there any way that I can point the finger at someone else who's responsible? Um, I know that uh, a lot of you are, are big proponents of personal responsibility, but when we're talking about subrogation, we want you to put that aside. You've got to think, someone else was at fault for my, my driver's injuries, and how are we going to pass, basically shift the liability from my company onto that other third party or their insurance company? And, that, and that's really what we're doing. We're trying to limit exposure on um, a different end here for our company and transfer it to a different company. So you, like I said, you've got to take off your claims adjusting hat and really put on uh, a subrogation or a trial attorney's hat. And that's what we do here at Matisse and Wickert and Lair, and that's why we're so effective doing what we do. Um, but, you know, again, when you get these claims in, if you've got questions, you know, Matisse and Wickert and Lair, myself, we're always available here uh, at our law firm to answer these questions just so we get it recognized from the beginning. Um, uh, just a basic, you know, 
kind of checklist when, when these claims come in. Um, you cannot wait for your member or your, your, your driver to hire counsel. If, if that's how we're identifying subrogation, we've got it all wrong. We've got to start from the beginning. We've got to identify, obviously you're identifying the injuries, but we've got to identify where there's a third party. And if there is, we've got to start obtaining evidence. And evidence is statements from our driver. Evidence might be photographs. Evidence might be uh, retaining a specific um, product. Evidence might be retaining an expert to go out and look at the scene. Um, it just depends on what type of claim we're, we're involving, but it starts from the very beginning. So uh, let's talk about the, the different contexts in which we're going to see these tort claims. Um, we've got to understand basic negligence, and, and that is that someone had a duty to your driver, and they breached that duty, and it caused uh, the accident and the injuries. Um, that's just very basic. Um, then we'll go through auto at, we're going to go through auto accidents. We'll, we'll talk a bit about premises liability, product liability, medical malpractice, governmental liability. These are just a couple categories that we're going to talk about. But auto accidents are the ones that you are going to see you know, the majority of the time. Your, your truck driver is on the road, and he is either hit by another vehicle um, or another truck. Um, he may strike another vehicle um, on his own, but that doesn't necessarily rule out subrogation. So what we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, obviously you're going to be seeing things um, um, related to speed. Someone was speeding and cut someone off. Someone was not looking out. Someone made an improper lane change. Um, someone rear-ended your truck driver. These are all common, and you can pick those out when you get a police report, which you should be doing in every auto accident case um, from the very beginning, and you can kind of see what the investigating officer saw. Um, but in these cases, you're always going to want to interview the driver as soon as possible. Take a statement. Write up some questions uh, about you know, the circumstances of the accident. And, and make sure if you can, obviously if you can record the, the, the conversation with the driver, great, and have that transcribed so you have that for your file, great. Um, that's going to be great evidence for us when we, when we try to, to go actually subrogate the claim. Um, but don't rule out. Um, out of the ordinary, if, say the police police report didn't necessarily determine liability or who was at fault, but once you talk to your driver, you find out, well, you know, the story changes. For example, we've had cases here um, involving you know rear end accidents where we were the we were the party who rear ended the other party, and so a number of companies or or, or maybe claims adjusters out there would just write that off from the beginning, but. Once we start doing a little bit more digging, and that's really what subrogation requires from the beginning, is, is doing a little bit more digging than just looking at a police report or um, you know, initial accident statement, is to find out what's the background here. Um, we had one case um, uh, that involved a, um, a cement truck driver um, who was rear-ended by our driver and in the middle of the night, um, and, and it, so it didn't look good. but. When you did a little bit more investigating and digging, you found out um, that the cement truck driver didn't have any lights on, and his rear his rear lights were uh, covered over in um, dry cement, so you couldn't see anything of this uh, cement truck driver when you're coming down the road. And to make that matters worse, he was traveling at 30 miles an hour, which is way under the speed limit at the time. So once we did this initial claims um, assessment did the interviews, took some, some photographs and talked to the driver, uh, we were able to determine that, yes, there was actually subrogation potential in a case where our driver rear-ended the other driver. Um, but again, we would never have found that out through the police report or without talking to the driver. And so that's why these are very, very important, um, important things to think about. Um, another thing that we've got to identify um, and this is going to be a state-by-state state focus, and it's going to be a policy-by-policy policy focus. So you need to be very familiar with your subrogation provision before we answer this next question. And that is whether we have a right in these auto accident cases to subrogate against underinsured or uninsured motorist um, coverage that might be available um, either to your driver or, to, um, or through a spouse's policy. It depends on how these, these play out. Um, 
but you know we're not going to be offering through our OCAC coverage um, necessarily you know the the UM um, coverage. Um, typically, that might be available through a separate auto policy. So when in those cases where there is this separate policy out there that your driver has taken out for UIM or UM, the question is, do we have a right to recover those dollars? Um, and, and typically, it's going to be very um, case specific, and it's going to look at the subrogation provision that you have in your policy. And I've seen so many of them, and there's so many differences, even so still today after uh, after we know how important plan language and policy language can be. Um, but basically, if if our subrogation provision says we have a right to subrogate against any responsible third party. The general answer as to whether you can subrogate against UM or UIM is no. And that's because your policy language has limited yourself to subrogation against a third party. And courts have generally held that third parties do not include UM or UIM benefits because that is a first party coverage. Um, so we need language like any party who may be liable or any party that is caused or is liable for. We, we, we need much broader language. If we limit it to third party, we can basically cross off any potential UM or UIM recovery. So um, another couple things that we'll want to think about is when you're doing auto cases, um, you know, we've got to, first importantly, we've got to know what the statute limitations is on our subrogation claim, and that's going to differ state by state, and everyone should have a chart. We've got a chart on our website, um, and I've got a special chart that I'm going to be offering to, to you guys after this um, seminar, specifically on occupational accidents, and it'll have all the statute limitations that you're going to need. Um, but second, you know, um, states are different. Um, you know, California might have minimum policy limits of 15, so you know that, that you're going to be dealing with a very limited pool of money um, from any third-party tortfeasor, whereas um, in my state, I believe they just raised it to like a hundred thousand. So um, it's going to be it's going to be very different state by state as to what the minimum insurance limits are. But that's important because we don't want to be spending a fortune chasing down you know fifteen thousand dollar policy limits, where we have to split those with um, our driver, especially. Um, a, set, a third thing: Do we is the state a contributory or a comparative fault state? In a pure comparative fault state, you know, even if our driver is partially or um, even sometimes significantly at fault, we can still recover from the third party where, there, where that third party has some, some fault out of their own. Um, versus, you know, there's a couple states out there, whether it's, um, you know, North Carolina, I believe, uh, Virginia, there's a couple other, a couple other one, where it's a pure contributory fault state. If your driver was 1% was at fault, for the accident, you cannot recover. Now, I don't want you to close up all your Virginia or North Carolina files because just because of that. Um, it's not quite as strict as it sounds, but um, it is something to be aware of. So, if we know that our driver was, um, you know, you know, driving a little bit carelessly, maybe he was um, uh, not paying attention. We know he was on his cell phone or uh, we know he was, you know, monkeying around while he was driving and not uh, not paying attention to the road. And there's evidence to that fact. That's something we'll have to think about before we go ahead and subrogate that claim. Um, but you've got to know the difference between a pure comparative and a pure contributory fault state. And then, and then there's some other states that we need to be concerned about. Those are the PIP or no fault states. Um, Michigan's an example, and uh, we'll go through. It's on the chart, but um, you know. We cannot subrogate in, in Michigan based on their no-fault statute um, because there really is no third-party insurer to go after. It's, there's a statutory auto provision that, that basically says if you're injured in an accident, you look to your own insurance company, not the third party. Um, so coverages can be different, um, auto coverages in, in different states. And we just need to know that um, going in. Um, medical malpractice. Here's one. Um, that you're not going to see all the time, but occasionally you will see one, and it'll be a big claim. Um, and um, how you recognize a medical malpractice claim is, is much more 
subtle. It's, it's much more difficult to recognize this type of claim than it is your auto collision claim. There's not going to be a police report that says, yes, this doctor was at fault. Uh, so you're not going to have anything like that. But what typically you're going to want to look for is, is a circumstance where your driver was injured in an accident or um, through, you know, through no fault of, of your uh, of, of, of an accident. He maybe was at home working and he had to, he had to go in for a surgery because he got hurt you know, doing something in the yard or he was going in even for a routine surgery. Um, that may or may not even even been covered under your policy, but um, well, obviously we need it to be covered under our policy. So let me, let me take that back. But once it's something that's covered under our policy, he's been hurt in an accident. He goes into the emergency room um, or is scheduled for a surgery. After that surgery has taken place, all of a sudden you see a, another spike in treatment. Um, that's a red flag. You know if if um, if um, if he goes in for um, you know to 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 repair a broken bone or or uh, to have um, some other type of surgery on the on the back or his neck or something like that, and all of a sudden you start seeing you know your your the claims adjusters are, are looking at this this and they see codes for you know treatment of infection or they they see codes for um, you know resuscitation efforts or life support uh, treatment. I mean, that, those are huge red flags, and, and that's, a, that's a great indicator that there is um, some medical negligence, medical malpractice involved. Um, now, proving a medical malpractice case is very difficult, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, I wouldn't recommend pursuing a medical malpractice case for something around you know, thirty dollars or $40,000, because you're going to spend that amount of money trying to work up that case. Um, but generally, you're going to be looking at the doctors involved, the hospital involved, because um, oftentimes they don't work for the same company. So you're going to be looking at both of those entities. Um, and the standard of care is different. Um, this is something that we've, we've got to consider in a medical malpractice case. You know, if your driver is, is, is in a hospital in Chicago, there is a very high standard of care um, that's going to attach to his treatment in Chicago versus if your your driver goes in for that same operation in St. George, Utah. Um, obviously, uh, there are better doctors in Chicago, and the law recognizes that there aren't uh, the same standard of, uh, of care in more remote or less populated areas. So that's something we have to also have to consider when we're working up those claims. Um, but there's usually notice requirements uh, that you have to provide the um, the uh, potential defendants with notice. Oftentimes, you have to uh, present notice to a state board, a medical malpractice board that, that will review the claims before you can go to litigation. And oftentimes, you know, especially in a lot of the conservative states, there are uh, damage limitations on how much you can recover for medical malpractice uh, for pain and suffering and, and, and those non-economic um, damages. So those we need to consider uh, when we're working up these type of claims. Now, premises liability. You're going to get a ton of these claims. These are probably the, the, the second um, largest volume claims that you are going to get um, following the auto accident claims. Um, because your, your drivers are out there. They are, they are traveling across the country. And they have to stop. They have to stop to eat. They have to stop to use the restroom. They have to stop to fill up gas. Um, and so that involves um, truck stops. Um, and, and you're going to see a lot of these claims. If you haven't already, uh, they're coming. And so you've got to be very familiar with how, um, what to look for, how the law treats it. Basically, uh, we're looking at slip and falls, trip and falls. Slip and falls involve usually some weather conditions, whether it's um, snow and ice. Trip and falls, we're going to be dealing with um, um, potholes, um, grates that are open, um, rods that stick out of the ground at these places. You'd be surprised the number of different things that your drivers can trip and fall over. If there's an obstacle, there's a good bet that a truck driver will fall, fall over or, or, or hit that obstacle. I don't know why it is, but it just seems to be the case. Um, well. 
the truck stop has a, a, a pretty good, uh, pretty significant duty to their customers, especially for these open defects. I mean, if there is a, um, a pothole next to the pump, um, it's very foreseeable that our truck drivers are going to fall into or our, our customers are going to fall into or trip on that hole. And so um, the, the truck stop has a duty to go ahead and look at that condition and fix it. Um, and if they don't, they've got a duty to warn their customers that there is this obstacle. So um, if, if there's a trip and fall case, think about it as being a good case from the start. But, but it's not a good case if you don't investigate it from day one. And, and that's the problem with these cases is a number of times you know, we will see cases um, involving a, a slip and fall or a trip and fall, and other than maybe um, an initial, initial a report of an, of an accident uh, from the uh, truck driver, we have nothing else. There's not going to be typically a police report because there's not another new, a vehicle involved. Um, what we need in these situations and what you need to know from day one is we need to know what the weather conditions were like what the lighting conditions were like. I mean, was this a situation where, where there was an, a, a, a defect that was well lit, or, or was this a defect that someone slipped over or slipped or tripped or fell over <laughs> when it was, it was dark, unlit, um, where they were supposed to park, and the uh, truck stop didn't have any proper lighting? That even adds to the, to the, to the, to the liability there. Um, we need to know those. So what do we need? We need photos. We need photographs either from the day of the uh, accident or from immediately as soon as you have noticed to send someone out there and get photographs. Um, and so that, that takes one of, one of two things. Either we're obtaining these photographs from the driver, and don't be surprised, these drivers almost always carry digital cameras with them uh, because they know there's going to be um, accidents, trip and falls, and they, they take uh, photographs uh, for themselves. And so Oftentimes, you can just get the photographs from the driver. If, you, if the driver does not have photographs, that means we need to send an investigator. And that investigator is going to have to go out there as soon as possible, around the same time of day, hopefully, and take photographs of uh, the, the obstacle or whatever it is, of the defect that, that the uh, driver slipped and fell over. Um, as far as slip and falls, uh, as opposed to the trip and falls, um, when there's an accumulation of ice or snow, uh, generally speaking, there's not any liability uh, for the property owner if this are, uh, occurred as a result of a natural condition. In other words, if it's snowing out, you know, the, the, they eventually have an obligation to, to clear uh, the snow away if, if there's going to be customers traffic through there, but not necessarily while it's going on or immediately right after. Um, so the law does not impose on them a very high obligation when it comes to clearing away the ice and snow. However, um, if there's an unnatural accumulation, for example, um, there's ice that forms around a downspout or around a grate that has been installed to um, uh, reduce the, you know, right, to, to uh, increase the flow to a certain area on the property. That's what you're looking for. That's an unnatural accumulation, and, the, and the, the property owner always has a duty to make sure that there are no unnatural accumulations of ice that they might slip and fall on. Or if they actually do remove the snow, but they put it all in big stacks or they, 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 they um, create an unsafe condition where they know their drivers are going to be parking, and they, then they slip and fall there, that's a great case too. But again, we need pictures. We need photographs. If we don't have evidence, uh, the only thing we have is this, the driver's word. Um, oftentimes, you're going to find out by the time I want to litigate that case, the, um, the defect is gone. Uh, the, the, the rest stop or the truck stop has taken care of it, and they fixed it, and so there's no evidence. All I have is the driver's word against the truck stop's word, and that, frankly, is just not a very good case. So those are the things you need on these premises liability cases. Um, just briefly, product liability. You're not going to see a lot of these cases, um, but occasionally you will see.
see the blown out or the uh, tread separated tire case where um, you know um, the, the tires simply blow out uh, due to a tire defect. Um, there's, there's, there's certainly some other uh, areas where there might be product cases involved, but the tire ones are probably the, the biggest ones. And if you get those cases, um, you're going to need to preserve the tires. You're going to need to get in there with an expert to take a look at these tires um, and, and determine what the defect was. You know, was this a new tire? Was it a refurbished tire? What exactly happened? Did it blow out? Or was there a tread separation? And there's specific experts that we use here for either of those types of cases. And they're very highly specialized. Um, and they've got to be good because you know, the Firestones and the Bridgestones um, and those, man, those tire manufacturers fight these cases very hard. But when, if you've got a product case, the only thing that I can tell you is you've got to get a good expert and you make sure you get the product. You know, you get, you get that tire. Frankly, I would get all the tires. Put them in a little warehouse, in a little a shed. Um, if you're going to litigate this case, get the tires um, from the vehicle. Because if you don't, it's called spoliation, and it could, depending upon the state, um, um, undermine your case entirely. Um, governmental liability. This is one that comes up uh, pretty frequently. Maybe not as frequently as auto accidents, but you know, oftentimes you're going to find that the, the third party that you're looking at is either an employee of uh, of a governmental entity or is the governmental entity themselves because they did certain road work or they were doing um, some type of um, um, construction work um, and, and you're looking at the, the government, uh, whether it's a town or a county, is responsible, is responsible for you know, maintaining certain stretches of roadways. Um, regardless, in the situations where you've identified a government um, as a defendant, there's different rules that we play by. And the first thing that we do is not file a lawsuit. Uh, whether it's the state or the federal government, the first thing that we have to do is almost always file a particular notice. And it can be with you know, as short as 60 days or 120 days um, in some counties and states to serve this first notice. This is why you've got to get on these claims right away. Because if you, if you haven't looked at a claim for subrogation potential, um, until six months after the accident, and it involves a state um, entity or even a federal, the federal government, and you haven't filed the, the right notice, and then you come talk to me and say, well, we want to pursue these guys. There's clear liability. And I'll tell you, well, we can't. You know, the notice was not filed. It was not sent. And so we have no claim. So the first step is going to be identifying what municipalities, what governmental entities are involved, and then filing the right notice. And you have to fill it out. It's, it's not as simple as sending a letter putting them on notice. You actually have to go through and identify all of the, the, the separate things that they want accounted for, like who you are, when the accident happened, um, what, are the, what are the injuries, what are the damages, uh, were there any witnesses. And, um, and so you've got to go through all that and put that in a proper notice. Um, the federal government, you know, obviously they're, the notice requirements are the same no matter where the accident happened. Um, it's a standard form 95, um, and you have to file that administrative claim within two years of the accident. And once it's denied, because it's always probably usually denied, you have a, then six months to file suit in federal court against that, that federal agency um, in order to pursue that claim. So if you haven't filed the, the administrative claim within two years, you're barred. If you wait until later than six months after that initial uh, claim has been denied to file suit, you're barred. You've got to file these, these strict rules involving governmental entities. Um, and railroad accidents. Uh, you know, I've been involved in, in, in a handful of railroad cases. They're very difficult. Um, and oftentimes, the claims adjuster has said from the beginning in the file, no subrogation potential, uh, driver ran into a, a train. Um, well, that's not necessarily the case. They're very difficult cases because the railroad has the benefit of federal law and, and, and they have the ability to preempt a lot of our claims um, that would occur under state law. 
um, as far as negligence goes and, and, and as far as um, you know the types of, of warning systems that they should have had. Um, but there are certain claims that, that survive preemption and, and we can pursue. So we're looking for obstructions um, to, the, to the driver's view. We're looking for potential signals that may have malfunctioned. And we're looking for whether the, the, the train employees, whether the conductor and the engineer, were keeping a proper lookout um, based on the type of activity they were doing. So um, don't just rule out uh, a railroad claim. Uh, if you've got a railroad claim, and whether it's a death or a very significant injury, call us right away because we've, there's certain things that you need to look for um, uh, in order to uh, for your claim to survive preemption. Um, there are there are some of the worst cases out there though you're, where you're just going to be disappointed because um, you know you just can't pursue a claim that there should have been you know lights and a crossing arm there and there was only a a, a, a cross box or a sign. Those are the things that the railroad has the benefit of federal law for them, and so that's why you need to call us right away on these railroad claims. But don't rule them out. Uh, part two. Let's move on to some of the legal concepts that you you've got to have a good understanding of um, now that you've identified a third party and now that you're going to uh, hopefully pursue them is, is what are the legal things that I'm looking out for. These are the six things we've got to, got to identify. We need to know about waivers of subrogation. We need to know whether the made whole rule applies. Um, we need to know about the common fund doctrine. We need to know whether there's any anti-subrogation laws in the state that we're that we are subrogating in. Um, five, we've got to be very familiar with the, our, our subrogation provision and what it does and what it does not allow us to do. And then six, we have to be cognizant of choice of law. And these are all, um, some of these are more basic uh, concepts for you, but some of them like choice of law and, and waivers of subrogation are going to be a little bit more advanced than we're normally uh, seeing in our, in, our, in our handling of the files. First, Waivers of subrogation are very important because we're going to see them a lot in our industry, in the trucking industry, um, and, and they're not going to be in your file. Um, you're, going to, you're just simply not going to know about them if you don't ask. And, and, and waivers of subrogation are essentially um, a, a clause in a contract between the motor carrier that your, your, your driver is driving for and um, a particular customer. Um, we get these a lot with motor carriers and Walmart. For example, if, you're, if your driver is delivering to Walmart and he is involved in, a, in a loading and unloading or he uh, happens to be injured um, um, because of a, a Walmart forklift driver or because of whatever negligence of Walmart, oftentimes you're going to have to, there's going to be a, a waiver of subrogation. Um, from the motor carrier's contract with Walmart that is going to prohibit us from subrogating against Walmart. Now, the driver may not have signed a waiver of subrogation, but remember, our policy is, is you know, 50% of the time, the, the named policyholder is the motor carrier. And so we are going to be stuck with whatever contracts that motor carrier um, has made and whatever waivers of subrogation they have entered into um, uh, against um, Walmart. Because otherwise what's going to happen is if you ignore that um, and you ignore the contract that the motor carrier gave, um, there's going to be usually a waiver and an indemnification provision. So what's going to happen is you're going to try to sue Walmart and Walmart is going to hand the lawsuit right back to the motor carrier. And you're going to have one angry policyholder in that motor carrier is going to call you and say, what the heck are you doing pursuing us on this claim? We're the ones who have liability for it. So on, on claims where there's going to be uh, a loading, unloading situation where the driver is at a location that he normally delivers to, you've got to ask and find out whether there are any waivers of subrogation between the motor carrier if the motor carrier is your policyholder and uh, that facility.
the made whole doctrine. Everyone hates this this uh, this doctrine because it's like our arch enemy. Um, plaintiffs' attorneys, almost in, in no matter where the states are, they will always say, "Well, you know, the settlement doesn't make my client whole. It's 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 inequitable for you to have subrogation until um, until my client has been made whole." Uh, well, well, what is first of all, what is the made whole doctrine? And, and the made whole doctrine is simply a, a statement of law, sometimes through cases, some, sometimes through a statute, that basically says um, the driver, um, the claimant, has a right to be co fully compensated before the insurance company. It's a rule of priority. And if the made whole doctrine applies, you have second priority, not first priority. Um, now, for example, there's, uh, I'll give two states. Georgia has is, is, is always been one of the, more, the, the most difficult states to subrogate in because they have the made whole doctrine in, one of their, in a particular statute. And so everyone in the state knows about it, and it's very difficult to prove uh, that your claimant has been made whole in Georgia. It's that statute right there, 33, 34, 56.1. Um, Colorado has now just joined. Um, um, Georgia, and and just this year passed a made whole statute that that applies to um, OCAC policies like ours, um, and it says that in Colorado the claimant has to be or the driver has to be made whole before the insurance company recover. It's a little bit different than Georgia statute, and there's some benefits that we can talk about um, that are a little different, but still it's a statutory uh, endorsement of the made whole doctrine. Wisconsin is another made whole state. Um, however, Wisconsin didn't do it through a statute. Instead, we did it through uh, case law. And some judge made up his mind um, back in the 80s that the insurance company had second priority because uh, it just was. It just felt better to make sure that the um, the individual was made whole before the insurance company was. Um, and so he put it in a case, and it was affirmed, and it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, we agree. Um, but, you know, there are a number of states that simply don't have a made whole requirement. And, and Massachusetts is an example. There's nothing in the case law or in the statutes that requires uh, the driver uh, to be made whole first. And so um, if you're in federal court, it's a different system. Um, and in many cases, in many circuits, um, have a federal common law of make whole. Other circuits reject make whole. Um, so you need to know what jurisdiction you're in um, before you can even determine whether made whole is going to apply. And in some states, even if it is a made whole state, it can be avoided if we have good language in our subrogation provision that gives us uh, through a con through the contractual right, a first priority, notwithstanding whether the, the, the covered person or the driver was fully compensated. That's the language that you need in your subrogation provision in certain states like Texas, where we can now, thanks to the Fortis case, contractually override the make, the make whole doctrine. Um, there's other cases, other states, where if the if the driver settles within the defendant's policy limits, there is a presumption that he has been made whole. Now that doesn't apply in Wisconsin, but it does in Ohio. It does um, in, in South Dakota, or excuse me, South, in, in, in West Virginia. It's a federal decision there. And there's also in the new Colorado statute um, that was just passed this year a rebuttable presumption that if the uh, if the plaintiff settles within policy limits, he is presumed to be made whole. And then he has to go and prove that he was not made whole. So that it just switches um, who has the burden of proof, but um, it, it's definitely something that we need to be aware of in those situations. The common fund doctrine, that, that's one that applies in every jurisdiction. No matter where you are, uh, it's going to apply to some extent. The, the doctrine differs a little bit but basically what it does is where the insurance company, where we have, as an OCAC carrier sat back and, and merely corresponded with the plaintiff's attorney, and he has gone out, filed suit, recovered um, a settlement or a judgment, um, 
and then has to honor the lien, he is going to be allowed to reduce your lien by a, by a third generally, um, and in some states up to 40% based on his contracted attorney fee. Um, so be, because we've sat back as an insurance company and not actively participated in the case, intervened, hired our own attorney, the law is going to charge us um, as if we had retained the services of that, that plaintiff's attorney. Um, so we need to know that, and that's going to apply in just about all the states we're dealing with uh, subrogation in. Again, the chart that I'm going to uh, talk to you about that we've created here at the Thiessen Worker and Lair goes through the Common Fund Doctrine, the Main Hole Doctrine um, in, in every state uh, as it applies to OCAC policies. And we've got that for you. It's going to be available after this presentation. So you can have a, a quick cheat sheet of all these important doctrines uh, right at your fingertips. Um, there's, there's, there's really only a, a couple ways, or really, the, frankly, there's only one way to destroy or to even argue that you can destroy the common fund doctrine. You can't do it, you remember like the main hold doctrine where, where I, I had a policy example where we could override it? Um, well, we can't do that in our insurance policy with the common fund doctrine. We could if we were an ERISA plan, but we're not. We're, we're, we're not talking about that right now. We're just talking about a straight non-ERISA OCK Act policy, and the courts will not allow us to put a provision in there to override the common fund doctrine. Instead, the only way uh, that we can override it is by intervening into the case and actively participating. Um, oftentimes, we'll try to intervene, um, and if we're not allowed to actually attend depositions or do discovery, and in the end we still want to have uh, the, the common fund disclaim because we hired an attorney, that necessarily won't be the case because we didn't actively participate. Uh, it, it's state by state and it really depends on, on how the state applies that. Um, in some states you can just simply intervene um, without taking a lot of, uh, without doing a lot of work and you won't be charged the common fund. In other states you have to actively participate. Um, it just depends on the state. Um, then the other things that we've got to be looking out for is whether we're in an anti-subrogation state, whether there's a state law or state uh, case that, that basically says we have no subrogation rights. Um, there's a couple varieties of those statutes. Um, Indiana has a lien reduction statute, which I would call an anti-subrogation statute. Um, it, Indiana allows subrogation but it then allows your occupational accident lien to be re reduced by not only the, the attorney's fees, but also um, by, by the same uh, proportion of fault that your driver was. So if your driver was found to be 40% uh, at fault, your lien is reduced by 40%. And then it, you know, it's also reduced by attorney's fees and costs. Um, so it can, it can significantly impair your, your recovery under that statute. There's other anti-subrogation laws. Pennsylvania has one, uh, and this is a tricky one because there's some um, dispute as to whether it's going to apply to OCAC policies, um, but there's no Pennsylvania state case on point. There is one in the, in the federal court that's unpublished that I've got in our chart, which you can take a look at um, afterwards, but this is a statute that prohibits subrogation in cases involving motor vehicle accidents, so that's why it's going to be targeting us because we're dealing with truck drivers. Um, Virginia has a statute that prohibits subrogation involving hospital, medical, surgical, and related benefits. Um, but notably excluded from that can of Virginia statute is disability benefits. So in Virginia, we can't subrogate the medical portion, but we can subrogate the disability portion. And so, so I've got that in the chart, which states you can subrogate in the medical and which you you can subrogate the disability. You're going to want to look for that um, because it's going to be different depending upon the state. So just because you're in Virginia and the plaintiff's attorney tells you, hey, this is an anti-subrogation state, well, you can tell me, yeah, but not for disability. Subrogation of death benefits. This is another tricky, tricky area that we need to um, be aware of in death cases because oftentimes we're paying accidental death benefits. Okay, and so what, how does the law uh, uh, treat us um, regarding um, these, these, these death cases? Um, 
this is where we need very broad subrogation language in our policy um, that would allow us to recover any and all benefits not only from, from the, the covered person, but from his estate, his beneficiaries, his heirs, because otherwise we're going to be very limited because the way death cases work is that when your employee, when the driver dies, the law sets up a, a legal creature called the estate that is able to pursue um, claims for, for example, medical benefits that were paid prior to death and funeral expenses. And that's it. That's the only claims that your driver would have. So your driver has no claim for death benefits or for, you know, those type of, uh, of unique um, benefits. Instead, his heirs, his survivors, his beneficiaries have a claim. But you don't have a contract with his beneficiaries. So it becomes very difficult to try to subrogate for these death benefits um, against a party we don't have a contract with. That's why we need very broad language to at least be able to argue that we are entitled to subrogate for those benefits because the contract, because the driver agreed his beneficiaries would have to reimburse the uh, uh, the ACAC carrier. Uh, again, let's focus on policy language. This is where it becomes very important. I want to just kind of highlight some of the language that we need to be looking for in our policies. One, on the made whole doctrine, do we have a first priority right regardless of whether the, uh, the injured employee or injured driver was fully compensated? If we don't, the main whole doctrine will apply in those states that it applies. Second, common fund doctrine. We can try to put um, um, language in there and, and try to argue that, and, and I've done that. I've argued that the policy doesn't allow it. Um, but really, in most cases, we're dealing with we need to intervene. We need to actively participate. So we can't really do too much in our policy on the common fund doctrine. Um, again, payments made by any, anyone other than a third party. We, we've got to, we don't want to have our policy di define third party. Uh, we want it to be another party or any other party. So we can subrogate against anyone, not just the third party, but the, the UIM, the UIM carrier, no fault carrier if we, if we can in certain states. And we've, we've got to have very broad language in our policy to do that. Um, Again, allocation. I strongly recommend having a broad definition of who uh, the covered individual or the covered uh, participants are, and that not only that those participants, but their the estate of, the representative of, the beneficiaries, the heirs, they've all got to cooperate, and they are all bound by the subrogation provision. Otherwise, we are walking away from subrogating uh, some of those large death claims. It's just a simple fact uh, of the way that the law treats these cases. Unless we can argue that they're covered under the policy language, we don't have a subrogation right. Um, we don't want to limit our, our subrogation rights to medical or disability expenses. We want to provide for a right of subrogation for any benefits that have been paid out of any recovery. Not, not, not. To, oftentimes, I'll see policy language that limits it limits the, um, the, the subrogation to only those um, uh, categories of recovery. For example, if you recovered medical expenses, we have a right. Very, very, uh, very, uh, it's very unlikely that there, the, any settlement is going to divide out, this is for medical expenses, this is for disability. And, and even if it does, it allows the, the member then to control your subrogation rights by allocating recovery to other category, pain and suffering, um, loss of consortium. And, and, if, and if that happens, you can really minimize your subrogation interest. So we want very broad language there. Always require cooperation. Oftentimes, if you want to require a subrogation or reimbursement agreement be signed, you can do that too as a separate matter. Um, and then finally, it has to provide, it has to provide for a credit or an offset. Otherwise, you're not going to be allowed to, to have a future credit um, in those cases where you've got a lot of future benefits to pay and the, the, the insured has recovered a sizable amount for future medical expenses. Um, if you don't have a credit lang uh, language in your policy, you are going to end up paying future benefits even though he's also recovered those in the third-party lawsuit. 
Now the last advanced concept I want to cover is this, this concept of choice of law. And, and frankly, it's very, very important in those cases where we're in an anti-subrogation state or a state that limits our subrogation rights, a made whole state, um, because we know our drivers are all around the country. They are, they are traveling in different states every day. But the policy that was made be, between the, the insurance company and the motor carrier or the, uh, our, or the driver's driving association, that is um, going to be delivered in a specific state. And sometimes, you know, in the best policies, it actually has a choice of law provision that says this state's law applies whether it's um, uh, Iowa law applies because that's where the trucking association is, or um, uh, D.C., the District of Columbia law applies because that's where the insurance trust is. Um, in certain states, depending upon their choice of law rules, we can argue that our subrogation rights or our reimbursement rights are governed by Iowa law or D.C. law. We want to get out of the anti-subrogation states and have the court apply a much more subrogation-friendly um, rule of law. And so that's why we look to our contract and see if we can make arguments uh, that a different state's law applies. So don't just necessarily close every uh, subrogation file that you have in Missouri because it's an anti-subrogation state. Um, we might be able to argue, um, you know, for example, um, that a different state's law applies. or if you get, if you're, uh, like I said, we're, we're, we're doing this from day one. So if we identify in my hypothetical here that um, we've got a, a, for example, a Kansas accident, Kansas anti-subrogation state, but the driver is from Colorado, the torque feeser is from Missouri, but he's driving for an Iowa company. If you come to me with that set of facts, I'm going to tell you what we have to do is we have a race. We have a race to the courthouse. If your driver files a lawsuit in Kansas, or if your driver files a lawsuit in Colorado, both, both um, either made whole or anti-subrogation states, um, we're going to be out of luck. And so what I would tell you is that we have an option of filing a lawsuit right away in Iowa, where the defendant's trucking company was. Um, and we need to file that first there, because we're going to have a right to, to full reimbursement if we file in Iowa. And, and oftentimes, the problem that I have is that the insurance company comes to me with this fact scenario after their driver has already filed suit and uh, in Kansas and made a recovery. And I, can't, I tell them, there's nothing I can do at this point because we needed to be the first one to file, and we needed to file in Iowa. So these are why it's very important to identify the different states that are involved and how we can avoid being in an anti-subrogation state. Again, it starts from day one. Um, so you've got an, I mean, I've got some examples of, 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 of where uh, states will apply um, choice of law provisions. Sometimes in, uh, some states will, Minnesota will, um, California will not. Um, it just depends. There's different tests, um, um, again, involved. But if you've got a choice of law question, call me up. Call me up early so we can still make a decision as to what to do because the different states treat these very uh, differently. Um, and then just uh, we've got about five minutes left here. I want to close up with, with once, um, now that we've kind of understood how to recognize what we're looking for uh, for subrogation, and then that there's a number of different potential obstacles to subrogation um, and how to overcome those, I just want to talk briefly about you know, what we can do going forward to maximize uh, our subrogation potential. Because obviously what we want to do for the company, our goals are really to um, maximize subrogation. Uh, we want to shorten our life, uh, the life cycle of these files. We want the money coming in quicker rather than later. And, and so what, we, what I recommend is really having a, a, an in-house subrogation unit. Um, you know, people whose responsibilities are, are, are solely focused on subrogation. Um, that way, your claim side can focus on, on, on what it does best and minimizing the, the, the exposure to the company on the claim side. And your subrogation side can focus on, on, on identifying tort liability, recovering uh, evidence, taking statements, and 
uh, maximizing uh, the potential recoveries from day one. Um, so that would, uh, that's my recommendation. Um, however, if, if you are in a system where you have the claims handlers doing both, claims adjusting and subrogation, um, I would recommend, you know, from the beginning, getting in touch with us. All we do is subrogation. We can either um, guide you through from the beginning of, of claims. You can send them over from the beginning. Or you can, we can work with you uh, throughout. But you've got to have... You've got to make sure you identify subrogation from the beginning, and, and and if you can't handle it, try to outsource it. You know, and we're here to do that um, for you. Um, but here's a checklist. Just to, you know, create a sub. You know, regardless of how you do it, how you have it set up, have a subrogation checklist for that 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 person who's initially assigned to the claim, um, because it's so important. Because if we don't identify this for for a month, two months six months, you know, so much subrogation is going down the drain. And so that's why it's got to be fresh in, in that, that frontline adjuster's mind that they've got to be looking for the subrogation. If they aren't, um, you know, there are consequences. And so, so I've just kind of put, uh, you know, I just kind of whipped up a little uh, checklist and, and, and basically it's, we've got to talk to witnesses. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and have a conversation with the driver or the driver's passenger about what happened. Um, oftentimes, I see that we're just limited to you know, requ requesting police reports. Well, police reports are interesting, but they don't always present the, the entire um, um, scenario. It, it, number one, the police officer wasn't there when the accident occurred. So that's why it's important to talk to the witnesses who were. Uh, don't be afraid um, to talk to police, police officers or first responders about, about um, uh, what happened. Try to find out additional information that might not be in the report. And, and you know, all the reports are generally signed by the investigating officer, and you can always call that officer. Call the office, leave a voice message. Usually they're very good about getting back to you um, and answering your question, as long as they're not, um, you know, invading some type of privacy. Obtain photos. I can't stress this enough. You've really got to uh, obtain photos, especially in these trip and fall cases. Uh, and send an investigator. If you don't have photos from the driver, send an investigator. And they're not really that expensive. But if you get a local guy, they go out there, take some photos, and shoot them back to you. Um, now we have them for our file. We can go out there. We've got proof that there was a pothole and that it's you know in plain sight. You know that's great. Um, and then determine what state we're in. Are we in an anti-subrogation state, a main whole state? Are there arguments around it like we talked about? Um, you've got to identify that from the beginning. Um, otherwise, you're going to be spending a lot of time on a file that may not deserve it because we, we, we don't have any subrogation rights. Um, or um, just because we're in an anti-subrogation state, you might be writing it off when we shouldn't because we've got a choice of law situation. Um, finally, you're going to want to place all, no all parties on notice. Oftentimes, I see that um, um, companies are only placing the plaintiff's attorney on notice, and they're not placing... Uh, the, the defendant on notice. And that's a big mistake. You've got to follow up. You've got to place everyone on notice, um, including the defendants. Because you, frankly, when you can, you want to get uh, them to make any settlement check jointly out to you as the insurance carrier and the member. It, it makes tracking down the money and making um, and getting your lien back a lot easier when we put everyone on notice. And then finally, in the right cases, retain attorneys and, and, and experts for you know when needed. Um, but don't ever feel feel like you can't call us. Um, you know, even if, if you're, you're not going to send the file, um, you know, call us. You know, if you've got questions on how to investigate, what I should be looking for, you know, just call. We're, we're always here to answer questions. Um, again, um, my main. My main, my main goal is, that, is to get you looking from subrogation from the beginning. You've got to have a standard protocol set up. Um, even if you don't have a separate subrogation department uh, looking at this from day one, I would always recommend you, you have someone who is a, a subrogation czar, whether it's um, this gentleman here um, in, in the photograph or, or, or someone else. They don't have to dress up, but basically what they need to have is some type of oversight of all the files that come in so they can have an eyeball over whether we're looking at subrogation from day one 
and, and what information we're getting. Because I know that the claims adjusters are busy people um, just adjusting the claims. So um, having someone with oversight, um, partial, at least partial management um, um, abilities to over, oversee these files and make sure that the subrogation is being taken care of, it's so important. It's just very important. I can't stress it enough. Um, so we're, we're running up against the, the time here, um, and I want to see if we've got um, some, some questions that I can, that I can answer um, before we get, we get going here. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, I've got, <laughs> I've got one question about, uh, uh, from, from Ed. I know, I know you said that uh, ERISA might be implicated, but I don't understand how ERISA could ever come into play because these aren't employees. Um, again, like I said, it's a long, it's a long answer, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you Ed afterwards or, or whoever else. Um, but I think it's a, it's a really a misnomer out there that in order to trigger, um, you know, coverage under ERISA, this must be a traditional employer-employee relationship. Um, there's actually a provision that I've done a lot of research on in ERISA that covers um, insurance plans established by what's called an Employees Beneficiary Association. And um, based on um, my research, um, these trucking associations, who are the policyholders, are oftentimes going to be an Employees Beneficiary Association, um, as long as they restrict their membership to only truck drivers. And if they do that, in my mind, it's an ERISA plan, but we can we can talk about it. You know, I know it's controversial, but uh, if you've got questions after, um, um, we can talk about it. Um, let's see. Um, Lori asks, um, when you're subrogating in a made whole state and you don't have an argument that another state's law applies, how can you prove that your driver was made whole? Um, so okay, so so we're we're in a bad state, we're in a made whole state, and we can't um, argue that another state's law applies and we're stuck with made whole. Well, um, yeah, there's, there's basically a couple ways. Like I said, I mentioned in the presentation, there are some states that have um, case law or statutes uh, that provide a plaintiff is presumed to be made whole if they settle within the policy limits. If we've got that, great. Um, if we if we don't and we're really stuck with with a made whole situation, um, uh, then what we have to do is go through like a mini trial, and uh, there's always some type of procedure for this, either post settlement or post trial, where the plaintiff will put on evidence of what his total damages were, and we will compare that to what the subrogation interest was and whether um, you know he's required to be made whole for all categories of damages or whether um, he is um, required to um, be made whole for, for only a specific category. But there's one um, I'll point you to. I think it's the Tennessee. That if you look in my chart, we'll, we'll look at it in a second. Um, but if you look on the chart, there's a Tennessee case on there. It's a great case. Take, pull it up. Take a look at it if you need it, a copy of it. It really goes well through how uh, the made whole um, uh, thing works. Um, let me see if I can't uh, pull up uh, the chart for everyone so they take a look at it. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, I'm on the home page here, www.mwl-law.com. We scroll down. Uh, it just was put up here, so it's, it's under insurance resources. And these are all of our charts. Uh, we love charts here. I think they're very helpful uh, as a good starting place. And if you click on occupational accident subrogation in all 50 states, this was just put up. Um, and there it is. You can download the chart, print it out. You can use it. It's fantastic. Um, it's a starting point. We're still, you know, we'll be adding to it as additional cases come out. But it goes through each state, what the statute of limitations are, uh, whether you can subrogate for the medical benefits you paid, whether you can subrogate for the disability benefits you paid, because sometimes I said it's different. Okay, uh, then it'll go through whether made whole applies. What are the exceptions? Sometimes there'll be an exception, and I'll have highlighted that. Um, other times, whether there's a common fund doctrine and whether that applies. 
So, so go to the website. The chart is there for you to look at. Um, you know, um, it's going to be a very helpful starting point. It doesn't answer every question that you're going to want to know, but it, it, it's very helpful. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Art, and he asks, define state of delivery. Um, okay, uh, when I talked about where the contract was delivered, um, and I, I talked about why that's, that's important for understanding if we can argue that a different state law applies. Um, that the state of delivery of the master policy, the group master policy, is going to be where the, the policyholder, the trucking company is, or where the association is, or where the insurance trust is. It's usually defined in the policy. If it's not, you, you know it's going to be where the master policy was negotiated and where that uh, policyholder resides. Now, um, the member might argue, no, 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 it's where I live. But that's not generally the case. You know, um, the, the, the driver is going to be covered by a certificate, usually a certificate of coverage, that he's covered under this group master policy. And so that's not going to be where we're going to argue that, that, the, um, that the delivery is or that the contract is. Instead, he is a beneficiary of the, the group master policy. So it's wherever the group master policy is delivered is, is where that's going to um, apply. Um, I've got time for a couple more as long as you guys can stick with me. I know I've ran over about 10 minutes, but that, uh, I've had a couple more I could cover here. Um, from Doris, how do I go about documenting a future credit? Um, good question. Um, in work comp, it's easy. There's usually a procedure set forth, but since we're not work comp, um, uh, we don't have any specified statutory uh, way to go about documenting our, our, our future credit. So what we need is first we've got to have the policy language. We have to have language in our contract that says that we are entitled to a credit or uh, an offset against uh, the net recovery that the, the, the plaintiff has made in any, in any settlement or judgment. Um, without that language, we have nothing to enforce. We, 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 can make an, we can make an argument, but we don't have anything to enforce. Um, the court would never agree with us that we have a right to a credit if we don't have the language and the policy that, that allows us to have that. Um, assuming you've got the good language, um, basically you calculate the credit based upon the net recovery, what your driver has recovered after he's paid attorney's fees, costs, and uh, reimbursed your, 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 your lien, that you've already, the, the dollars you've already paid. So after that's taken off, it's whatever he pockets, whatever he gets put, put in his pocket, and, and that is a credit to you. Um, but because we don't have a, uh, you know, this isn't work comp, we don't get to document it through an administrative agency, I would always advise if, if we're dealing with a big future credit and that's going to be an issue, we want to take care of that in any settlement agreement that we would make with the plaintiff's attorney. Um, now I warn you. Once you start bringing up future credit, it's going to make negotiating the past lien uh, much more difficult. Um, but that's fine. Um, but I want you to be aware that I would prefer that if we're going to negotiate a credit, we get it in a signed document that we can keep for the file. And then um, as soon as we, we continue to receive bills, we just we knock off you know, what we would have paid for you know, this uh, particular prescription. And we just subtract that from our future credit and keep going forward. But you've got to document your file some way. So that's how I recommend doing it. Um, let's see what else we got. If we know, this is from Robin, if we know who the carrier is, should we put the defendant on notice in addition to the carrier? Yes, there's n absolutely. I do that as well as a practice. Um, so we know who the defendant is, um, and, and we know who the carrier is. Should we also put the defendant and the, yes, absolutely put both the, the insurance carrier for the defendant and the actual individual or corporate defendant on notice as well, um, definitely. Uh, that's just the matter of sending out two, two letters. Not difficult. You can do it. Um, let's see. Um, what happens if, the, is this from Cheryl, what happens if the driver and his attorney settle the claim prior to receiving our notice of lien? Can we still assert, and if so, against whom? Um, Absolutely. I mean, I assume that we've got language in our policy that not only entitles us to subrogation, but entitles us to reimbursement. So it uses both subrogation and reimbursement. 
And as long as we've got a reimbursement right, we can go directly after um, our driver and, and try to enforce the settlement. Uh, it can become difficult, but there's no there's no requirement that um, they have. Um, I mean, they've already have actual notice that we have subrogation rights. It's it's the, the contract, the insurance policy that they agreed to. So the fact that they did this quick settlement before we could get our letters out doesn't bother me. Um, and also, if if we had maybe they had settled, uh, but we already had the defendant on notice. In many states, we can still pursue that insurance carrier if they settled knowing that there was a subrogation claim out there and, and we had put them on notice. So um, getting the notices out early is important, but if you can't, if it doesn't happen, um, we still have a reimbursement right against the, the driver. And, and to, to, to really enforce that, we may have to sue him, but we've got a right. Um, so I, I've already ran over I, 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 by 15 minutes. I know there's more questions out there. Um, if you've got extra questions, I know I can't get to everything now, but just um, Go ahead, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to try and get back with you uh, on some of the questions you have or cover some of the topics in greater detail. Um, I know I was breezing through a lot of these topics, and they're very important, and I apologize, but um, um, I will try to follow up with anyone who wants, the, uh, who wants their questions answered or who wants a copy of the PowerPoint. Just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll shoot that to you as well. Again, you've got 1.5 hours of Texas CE credit. Um, talk to Jamie about it. Uh, oftentimes, you can transfer that TE credit to different states, um, um, and, and you can probably talk to us about uh, We might know how to do that, but you might have to look at, uh, on that on your own. But I know that most states are, are reciprocal with Texas, so that's a good thing. And again, uh, our next webinar will be July 21st. Gary Wickard is presenting at 10 a.m. Central Time on Advanced Workers' Compensation Subrogation. So tune in for that one. Um, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing from you. If you've got cases that you want handled, again, uh, we're a nationwide law firm. We will handle your OCAC uh, subrogation cases no matter where it is. Um, and, and so feel free to contact me if you've got questions. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. I, I hope you use the chart. Um, and um, if you've got any questions, just let us know. Thanks a lot.